Let's see. Mary's there. Lori's there. Okay. Uh, no public except Cat TV. So move on to finance. And uh, that's Mary's. Yes. Okay. Let me just get myself organized. Okay. So first thing to report is you got two more taxes collected last month, two more properties. So there's another $2,650 in the bank there. We just have one from 2009 and two other properties from last year left to go. We'll see. Now we start a whole new year. But the yeah. more important thing to know is that although I signed all the checks today, the tuition checks cannot be released until next week. We don't have our state money. Even if okay. I took all the remaining um, line of credit funds, we still would not have enough. Okay. Normally, it's around the 15th that we get the big 400 and some thousand dollars from the state. Um, I am not going to be around on Friday or Monday, but I've talked to Jim. And so, so Monday night, I'll be able to check the bank again and see if it's there. Is that Jim Kosas or Jim? Yes, Culkin? Jim Kosas. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, and I'll check tomorrow. Okay. By the end of the day to see if by some chance it gets there. But uh, all the other checks are good to go, but the four the Highland Hall, the South Shire, the SVSU, and the um, Village School. They okay. will have to wait until Tuesday. And then if by some, if we don't see the money on Tuesday, then we'll have to figure out what to, what to do from there. Okay. So uh, Tuesday is the 15th. 13th. 13th. Okay. I think it's the fifteenth, isn't it? How much short would we? How short would we be if we used the rest of the? Uh, if it's we 15. used everything, we'd still be short almost a hundred and four thousand dollars. Okay. Because some of what we have in the cash account actually is for the reserved um, sinking fund for the building, so yep. we really can't use that for everyday operating stuff. All right. But the 15th um, is Tuesday, and in the yep. past, we've gotten it around the 15th. Okay. So um, I don't know that we have a, you know, we don't have a particular set of arrangements with Southshire and Highland Hall, or for that matter, you know, and uh, the SVEUSD is in the same situation as we are, yes. presumably. Yes. So, uh, and we're obligated to be around the 15th for um, the village school. So mm -hmm. let's hope that all works out. Yeah. Now, I will let Highland Hall and South Shore know about that. So. Just in case they think they know that this is the meeting when the warrants are approved. Yep, sure. But yeah, right. so things will be paid in this month. It just won't be in the next couple of days. Okay. But all of the all of the tax bills for the new tax year are out. Um, two people have already paid, so we'll see where that goes. Right. Well, that's pretty good so far. Yes. How many taxpayers, how many bills are there? Uh, a little the over 700. Yeah. All right. So that's a, a very lot. small yeah. fraction. <laughs> All right. Um, so I guess we can move on unless anybody has a question about Mary's report or the treasurer's report that was included in the, the packet from the SBSU. Uh, we'll move on to the consent agenda, which includes minutes from last month, August 12th, and the warrants, of which there are three. And uh, Warrants are there. Are the uh, tuition warrants are and uh, are segregated out from in one warrant, and uh, then the uh, there are two other warrants that deal with uh, uh, vendor appropriate appropriations. 
So um, let me see here. I can go to that. So the first warrant is minutes for paying for Lori's minutes last month, paying Pembroke's removal of the trees and around the front uh, entry, serve pro at Bennington and Rutland for a cleanup of water damage in the fifth grade classroom. Um, a check to me for some building expenses that I put on my credit card to, and that check is only for the cost of the materials since I wasn't unable to get the sales tax removed because it was in New York State and it wasn't being delivered. And then the final check to Roy Terry for um, the last of his work on painting for the summer. And there's the, the uh, next warrant. Uh, actually, I'm wrong about this. It includes Highland Hall, payment to Highland Hall, South Shire Community Schools, uh, SV, UESB tuition for 14 students. Uh, why is it written this way? We've got tuition for 11, tuition for two, one, and then tuition for 11 again. I guess we missed somebody in there. That, that was because we had a late entry into the, that system. Right, Bob, right. Tuition for, should be tuition for one student, I would assume. Uh, no, the one student's above it. Uh, I don't quite know why, the reason it, the reason but it is a one student it's a student, amount. Right. Yeah. So it is not 11 students, but that makes 15 and we only have 14 that I know of. Yeah. So I'm unclear about that actually, but I trust Jim Kosas to have gotten that straight. I'm just surprised that I don't know it. And then tuition for the village school and, um, then that remember we had a we needed to repay the village of north bennington for taxes that were advanced that uh were actually the money was due to the village we, we uh, were overpaid and uh, then there's one vendor warrant which is uh for richard madison for carpentry work of rebuilding the ceiling in the fifth grade and finally, the last warrant is an add-on to pay Hayden Plumbing and Heating for repairing the, the roof drain, uh, actually the plumbing from the roof drain to the down spout to the uh, gym, through the gym, um, so that uh, we have a, a good system again for draining water from the top end of the of the uh, library roof. It comes off the gable uh, on the central main hallway and then it drops onto the, uh, the shed roof that's over the, over the library and some of it drains through, through drains right at that corner of the, that intersection and then some drains from further down, which is where this leak occurred the drain further down so and that's for eight hundred and twenty eight dollars uh, all right so that's the warrants the amounts i recommend we approve that and i'll entertain a motion to do so a motion no problem. comment Comment? You want to yes. comment? Yes. yes. Okay. I just wanted you um, to take a if you look at the Southwest UED thing, the one that says yes. the first line that says eleven students. I think that's only the ten, and then yeah. the last one is the eleventh because if you take that amount divided by ten, you're only fifteen dollars off yeah. the one student rate. Thank you, Mary. So, so it's just a typo on the yeah. on the. Uh, I think there's original. eleven in total, but there's ten in one group right. and one in the other. Right. 
Thank you. I figured it was correct. Just something is erroneous in the reporting. All right, so do I have a second? Matthew is uh, seconding and all in favor, wave your hand or say aye. 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 Okay, that's the consent agenda. There aren't policies. We have a superintendent's report. Yes, Jim's still here, so we'll ask him for that. Evening. Evening. Uh, so we did two weeks of uh, teacher preparation and professional learning, particularly dealing with how to deal with remote learning. Uh, every student, every teacher got the remote learning handbook. It's a book that we purchased for everyone to read about the tips and all kinds of links in it about how to make remote learning more robust than say, what it was in the spring. Um, yesterday, uh, remote learning began. Um, I don't have attendance numbers yet for how that worked. I've heard inc uh, incidental uh, stories from different principals that um, they thought it went well. There were some technical glitches, which we expected on our first day rolling out. I know that the tech department was swamped yesterday with requests for passwords and um, connection problems. Anything that we expected as we roll out something that we're not used to doing. Uh, starting next week, we will bring back, um, so the week of the 14th, we identified like what is 20% of the student population of each school so that we keep it small. And we don't intend to go to 20%, but who at that particular school has a need for in-person learning like either they don't have, we know they don't have internet access. So we're setting up remote learning labs inside the building so that they can come to school and participate using their, uh, their Chromebook in the school building. Um, and also some of our um, students that their learning style dictates that remote learning is not working for them or whatever um, challenges that they may face that we need to get them into the building for one-on-one um, -on -one instruction as soon as possible. So that's slated to start Monday. Uh, there will be no transportation next week though. So I don't think it'll be as impactful as it, we may think because over a third of our, and then this parent surveys that we did over a third of parents indicated they weren't comfortable putting a child on a bus right now and that they were willing to transport. So uh, in some schools, it's two students that could be coming next week and a dozen and some others. Week of the 21st, we have to bring pre-K and kindergarten students into the building to get them orientated to school. We do hope to have transportation running by the 21st, but we're rebuilding all our bus routes because of all the opt out of uh, families. Some bus routes will be altered. We just received, completed that information on Friday of who's opting out um, or who isn't opting out from bus riding. So that goes to our tech office and it takes them about 10 days to build the bus routes in conjunction with Newport transportation. So we may be pushing it a little tight on the 21st, but for sure on the week of the 28th, and that's when we'll become going to our hybrid model where we'll have students in school, physically in school two days a week, Wednesday is an asynchronous day and Thursday, Friday is um, the other 50% of students who were not in school Monday, Tuesday were there. And, uh, and we'll continue to monitor beyond that, uh, you know, changes in public health guidance, changes in COVID infection rates. And by uh, the end of October, we hope to be back to uh, having everyone back in the building. So uh, that's the plan right now. We keep saying everybody that's all subject to change with what the public health guidance is, or you know, is there an uptick in infection rates or anything like that. Food service did begin again yesterday, the distribution of lunches using our buses. That's gonna continue for at least two weeks while until we start needing, we need the buses the week of the 21st um, to begin the bus routes. We'll continue at that third week if the bus routes aren't ready. And then after that, it'll be pickup for lunches for those students that are um, operating remotely because families do have the right to opt out and be 100% remote learning and we're processing you know, those requests. 
We're also, um, you know, the, the state has advised us that they've had a record number of families who have indicated that they're going to do um, homeschooling, which is different than opting out for remote learning. Uh, if you're remote learning, you're still enrolled as a student in our school. Uh, homeschooling, you are unenrolled in, in taught at home. And you have to register with the state of Vermont to homeschool. So the state has advised us that, like I said, they have over double the amount of applications for homeschooling at this point that they had last year at this point. So that we should not be processing truancy claims for at least the first six weeks of school um, because it's going to take that long for the state to verify back to us that somebody has been approved for homeschool. So if someone tells us that they're homeschooling, we're to proceed like they are homeschooling until we get verification from the state. And then if we don't receive it, then what we traditionally do is consider the student true and, and begin that process to get the child back into school. So the other thing that, you know, obviously we're working with Efficiency Vermont for um, trying to get some ventilation projects started. Some have been, some applications have been successful, some have been denied, but allowed to be resubmitted with, you know, refined engineering. Uh, the um, continued to meet every week with the teachers union and the support staff union um, to get an agreement for their return to physically return to school because they do consider what we're doing a change in working conditions. So that is one of the reasons why we're still operating remotely. I think we're close to signing an MOU, a memorandum of understanding. Uh, we met yesterday, back and forth with attorneys today, um, but it really hinges on the asynchronous day, which is Wednesday. Our, our teachers required to be in the building our power educators required, uh, required to be in the building? And the simple answer is yes, um, particularly for our support staff. What, what we, we think that we would struggle to assign them work to do remotely, you know, our power educators, particularly if they're a one on one parent to a student. So we would require you to be in the building. And that's one of the sticking points. Um, the, and the teachers would prefer to work remotely on. On those on Wednesdays on the asynchronous day, so that's being considered, and hopefully, you know, we'll reach an agreement before they return on Monday. Um, that's pretty much what, what's been occupying my time and answering. You know, I'm, I'm, we're also processing. I mean, we had I told you this before. We had over 100 requests from staff members to either take a leave of absence or work remotely, um, and. So as we're processing those down, I think we're going to really drop that number down by one offering remote, um, you know, learning labs within schools and um, school care, which is another project that we're working on, which is um, child care, but it's called school care under this model because of license and differencing. And uh, we'll be able to allow a staff member to bring their child to school, put them in school care. And uh, we are encouraging principals that if someone has a valid reason to work remotely, if, you know, not that it's the principal's decision, but to find a way to, can we accommodate somebody's request to work remotely? Because if we lose their services because they take a leave of absence, uh, given the sub situation, I'm not, I tell the principals, I'm not really sure you're going to be able to replace the services. So if you can get those services remotely and it can function, then we're encouraging, you know, that to happen. But a lot of that is not finalized. Some people automatically, you know, I'm not talking about uh, people who meet the federal guidelines to qualify for a leave of absence or um, you know, Family Medical Leave Act. You know, those, those those are law, but we still we also have some people who are requesting um, leave of absences or to work remotely that don't fit into those categories. So uh, we can take, like we did another round of meeting with principals today as the list narrows down. So, all right, here's the people from your building who are requesting this. And, is on the list who we think we can get school care to and who we can accommodate by them bringing their child from remote learning and kids who's left who on this list you know can you see them doing their job remotely based on what specifically they do for you or those who you know yeah, the example would be it would be awfully difficult for a school nurse to work remotely right now so uh not that i have any requesting a little of absence but that would be you know, the most solid example of that 
someone we'd probably have to say no to and then find a replacement. So school care is for the teachers, uh, children teacher, of well, teachers, or yeah. staff teachers, staff, staff children, staff, yeah. staff children that they can yep. do the job and um, you know as could they're considered essential workers. Whether we'll yep. have the capacity to ramp up to take essential workers, children beyond uh, uh, families of the SBSU um, or staff out of the SBSU, I don't know that yet because. Um, we don't have um, the numbers of who's going to request it. I mean, a lot's going to a lot's going to be found out. You say Monday as we, we bring people back in the building, we see who who actually is in the building and who is impacted and can't can't be that. And we also may have people who are in the building come in on Monday and by the end of the week are telling me that they're struggling and they they just can't come to work every day and they are going to request a leave of absence. So um, okay. it's going to impact what we do. Yep. Uh, what does the transportation contract? Uh, what? How does it deal with the uh, drop in uh, well usage? Yeah. The non-use and the drop in usage. Well, we're still using them for. Um, it's still the same number of buses right now. We're still using them for food delivery service. Right. Okay. Not paying for any additional buses at this time. Once we start transporting special needs students, which is the other big part of our transportation budget, then because that's more of a direct bill, that's not where we sign a contract for how many buses are doing the bus loops right. for all schools. Right. Okay. So it's, it's a uh, moving target. <laughs> Asking everybody to you know remain flexible, and I I'll repeat what I say. You know, nobody asked for this. Um, it's nobody's fault and people are doing the best they can and yep. um, we're not going to be able to please everyone but I truly believe that people that I work with are trying their best. Okay. All right. Um, so does anybody else have any questions? Some of you have children in, in the middle school or the high school and uh, might have questions <laughs> about that. Actually, Jim, about the um, you know, the hybrid model where we're gonna, you're going to be bringing students in and then doing the remote learning on Wednesdays. Are they going to follow like the same time schedule like they do on the remote learning? Like right now, it's eight to one. Is it going to follow the same, or is it going to? It's going to be different than the eight to one, but it still will be an abbreviated day because. Uh, we got to get people, everyone has to have their temperature taken and get into the buildings. We feel processing. Um, I don't have the hours in front of me uh, for what it will be for the middle school in the hybrid model. Um, so I, it, it won't be exactly the eighth one. It's a, right. it's still, still eyeing that, up. particularly from the, we have it pretty much set with the middle, with the elementary, but if you give me a minute, I can. I'll pull that up and get to it. Um, are there like those, those special needs students, are they still going to be going in Monday through Friday? Keeping up? That's that, and that's who, not all, those who I, you know, their I, I think requires some. Require yeah. That? yeah, so it wouldn't be every student with an IEP. So, so the week of. Yeah, I don't have the hours on this right now. Okay. Half, it, it's half class on Monday, Tuesday, so I'd say it'd be close to that that time. So, it's, so starting the week of the 28th, Mount Anthony Union High School, sixth graders. Um, no, I still don't have that. I don't, I, I don't have the middle school hours in front of me, so I don't want to <laughs> publicly announce it and be wrong. Okay. Yep, I totally understand that. So, yep, so any other questions? Anybody have a question? It's a complicated system you're running right now. And, yeah, um, it's, I mean, I, I, I think I have some very frustrated people warning me because, you know, they're, yep. our principals are under a lot of pressure right now and you know, they can't, yep. you know, they can't please everybody, but we're, 
we're trying to support them the best we can encourage people and um I know it's not the school system that everybody wants it to be. It's not education doesn't look like we know it to be, um, right. but hopefully we'll get back to whatever normal is as quickly as possible. And um, the what you've laid out is into the hybrid model with uh, some students coming two days a week to actual uh, schools and not further into uh, a more an expanded in schools setup yet. Yeah. That's going to be depending on a lot of variables that right. have to be worked um, out. What we're working towards is the week of October 26, which is our, our least restrictive phase three. Depending on what the latest guidance is from the agency of education and the Department of Health at that time, that all students will return. Uh, for four days a week, with um, which would be at 100% Monday, Tuesday, 100% Thursday, Friday. Wednesday remains the asequence day. Part of that okay. is that to try to meet contractual obligations to the teachers about prep periods because the schedules may look so different on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday that they're, we're giving them that day as preparation time that they're entitled to contractually. Okay. Tim, have you heard anything from the state? Now you mentioned October 26, you know, 100% in, in class four days a week in the school. Um, has the state said anything about, you know, potentially, have you heard everything about, you know, like colleges and stuff, other places shutting down come Thanksgiving and going full remote again? Um, that potential talks? The state would prefer that we were open right now with all students in school. Uh, that you know they're they're saying there's no reason that why we can't but the reason that many of the reasons that, that why we operate remote is you know we're not ready with the ventilation to deal with the ventilation issue uh two we really wanted to get out of the heat of uh, in buildings that are not air conditioned get out of the heat for students who are in staff who are wearing masks uh yep. all the time um, we're still figuring out the staff issue, whether we're going to have enough staff to come into building as they, you know, we work through their requests. So this, this slower start gives us, I think, steadier footing as we move through and see how all our systems work mm -hmm. and then with the goal of getting everybody back in. But at the same time, we will maintain our ability to go 100% remote if we have to. Is that you know? But there, there is no. There was talk about a statewide plan, a statewide calendar. I haven't seen that develop. We're still waiting to see if the legislature will reduce the uh, student day count from 175 to 170, because otherwise, because starting the eighth, I'm about three days behind using our current right. calendar to meet those uh, to get 175 days in. So I'm hoping that you. Know, the indication is that they are considering that the secretary of education said he has recommended that. Um, so I'm hoping that that will happen and then we'll release an updated school calendar because I am getting asked by that. And people are afraid that we're going to cancel an April vacation or February vacation. There's no plan to do that at this time. So, um, but it, uh, yeah. what we did, you know, it all comes down to how many snow days we get, how late will we get out of school and whether we will, uh, attempt to operate remotely on snow days uh, this year as opposed to um, previous year calling a snow day. So we not call yep. it a snow day, but call it a remote work day, which is discussions I'm in with all the Southwest Vermont uh, area superintendents because we'd like to do something uniformly on what those days are like. Yep. Um, but one of the points that were brought up at a previous meeting is um, often in storm related school cancellation days that goes along with a power loss. So what, you know, sending kids home with their Chromebook in a snowstorm may not necessarily be the solution. Um, so what will we have in plan for that? So we'll get through the opening school, but that, that bad weather will be here before we know it. So we have to iron out what we're doing. I would like to say that we wouldn't have snow days, but just have remote learning days. And we may call them further in advance, like not necessarily in the morning, but before kids go home, let's say, 
you know, the weather forecast looks like Wednesday is going to be a horrible day. Maybe on Tuesday, we make sure everybody goes home with their Chromebooks and it'll be a remote learning day. That would be the ideal plan, but I'm positive it's going to work because it doesn't work for all students. And if I don't do a meal count that day, there's implications with that too. Because when I do a snow day, it doesn't count as a snow day, so I don't distribute meals. It's okay because we make enough of another day at the end of the year. But if I really count for a remote day, how do I get meals out to kids? So it's there's no no easy right answer. But not adjusting the calendar at this time. And uh, but the other thing is that we're you know our pandemic planning includes is we may have to school or close schools, but not all schools. You know, if there's a if there is a, a spike in one building, um, then it could be that that school goes remotely, but it wouldn't be SVSU wide like it is this time. And that would follow public high, uh, public uh, health guidance in that we've created protocols for everything. Like that. If a student arrives sick, if a staff member arrives sick, if a staff member becomes sick during the day, if a student becomes sick during the day, and here's the protocols that will be that we will follow. Uh, you know, created isolation rooms, provided tents that will be outside for doing the health screening outside before people come into the building. Um, I'm sure there are many things that we haven't thought of, and that's why, you know, at some point we've got to go live. And that's what we hope to start doing Monday and see how everything shakes out. Well, I'm wishing you good luck. Thank you. You're definitely going to need some. <laughs> Yes, I second that. Good luck to you, Jim. Thank you. Yep. I keep saying this. I work with some great people. I have wonderful people to work with, so um, it's helping. Yep. But uh, the best laid plans often run a, run aground on small things that yep. are unanticipated because it's difficult to foresee everything that can come down the pike given that there are lots of variables that you don't control and some you don't even know about. Um, okay. Um, so are you going to stick with us the whole meeting or are you going to go elsewhere, Jim? It's up to you. You want me to? I can sit here. Or well, I'll turn um, a little bit to you. A couple of things before you leave, if you're going to leave. I'm um, in no rush. So go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, I I had a question. Well, I just wanted to, I know ultimately we're going to see on, uh, as a FYI on board agendas, an ADM report. I would like to see ADM for this district again. And uh, then I have a question that maybe uh, there's, things I don't know that I should be considering. Um, Tim Newbold had asked um, me, and I, I included Kim in this discussion about closing the pay playground to uh, post-school uh, uh, use by uh, children. Uh, at once school is out, that it would be closed, uh, posted for no use in the, that time and period. And um, because we don't have any control over the playground, it can, it's likely to end up still with some use. But um, we, um, his view is that um, we need to warn people not, not to not to use it. Uh, maybe Kim can state this better than I. I'm um, yeah, sure. So exactly the there, um, we have a village school. Tim and staff have outlined a very specific um, drop off and pick up protocol. And there really is not even opportunity for the children to play on the playground because it's. Um, we have staggered start times by um, by alphabetical order of your last name. You have, uh, and then two drop-offs on either side of the building. 
so that every child is greeted at the gate with um, their health screener screening and temperature check and then hand washing and immediately to the building so there's no there is no opportunity for the children to go to the playground after school um the children now that the weather is good this is how it's working i'm not exact i have somewhat of a rough idea of what will happen when the weather is inclement but again that's this the children stay with their teachers in their little pods pre-k kindergarten and Lori, if i'm getting this wrong please pipe in um until they see a parent or until the school knows that a parent is there the same kind of size of the building and then they're released immediately to the parent um so there really is no immediate time for kids after school to play on the playground either however you know once all the kids are gone and the teachers are back in the classroom or they've gone home um may that's when maybe the concern is um for playground use but for i would say 20 to 30 minutes directly after school um there really isn't an opportunity unless um kids are waiting I, I don't know I, I don't know how kids could play in the playground but tim had written to the school board asking that he could officially close the playground down and i also believe some of the reason for that not only to encourage um social distancing um but also they have to clean the playground and Lori, do I, I think I have that all, I think, I think I have that all right. Did Lori hear that? I don't know. During the winter time, I think they're going to be releasing from their classroom. Right, but I just mean now in addressing the playground issue. Um, I'm sorry, but the last couple minutes, I everything was frozen, Kim. No, no, that's okay. We, we were just, Ray and I were discussing Tim's request to close the playground down, the playground equipment. Right, I um, heard most of that part. Yeah, right. Um, I do know that we have, during the day when school's in session, we have a, a list. And, for example, only kindergartners can use the playground on Monday. And that's it for the week. Uh, the structure. Right. Piece. And then on Tuesday, first grade can use that. So, and there's several cleanings of that equipment in between. So they're really concerned about keeping um, and sanitized and they've been, they're washing the equipment. And I, I know that there've been some issues on the playground after hours and they're worried about sanit, you know, sanitizing everything and having it, um clean when school begins in the morning you know so it's all been kind of a big big issue so okay. i don't i don't know what the answer is um you know it's so Tim, i think he was asking us correct me if i'm wrong Lord, but he was asking and ray he was asking us because we are the sort of keeper of the facilities and the grounds if he could just, if, if he had our permission to close that off okay. for all and, the same uh, reasons. We, Kim and I both agreed that he had our permission to do so. Uh, the rest of the board could weigh in on that if they have any feelings one way or another about it. And I just put it here for Jim, to, if, if he has any thoughts about it that, or uh, he wishes to express it, I'm looking for it, so thank you. Um, like Connell requested to reopen their playground and we did allow them. The public health guidance says they can reopen. Um, and you have to continue, you have to wash it down like any other piece of equipment. And that's the message that we've sent to the principals. Yep. If you have, um, uh, and, and kids are supposed to wash their hands when they come back in from the playground. So if they have the ability to uh, clean the playground equipment before school comes open. Um, it, the principals that I've talked to want to reopen the playgrounds. Um, and even if you close your playground at night, um, you know, I don't know how you're going to prevent, because we, we closed them and, you know, I was getting pictures all the time sent to me of people on them, on equipment. Yep. So, sure. You know, I think one of the big deals is that um, it, 
closing it at three o'clock, um, parents would see that the yellow tape is up and there's a sign there and they will just go home with their children. And that is really the hope. The hope, we don't want parents to sit on the benches with their children and let their children play without their masks, et cetera, before and after school, because all during the day, especially with me, with five-year-olds, I'm telling them to please put your mask on, please wash your hands, please don't touch that. You know, so it just sends the wrong message. And Jim, you're absolutely right. After Tim goes home and everyone's gone, who knows who's on the playground? That's not something we can even, you know, um, we, we can't monitor or enforce that. But I think the bigger picture, am I right, Kim, is that yes. please take your children home. Please don't let them congregate. It's not, it's not the message we're trying to send that, okay, school's over, so you can take off your mask and go play on the playground. Right. <clears throat> so in yeah. my mind, that's what we're talking about here. Would yep. there be any way to, you know, just kind of tape off the equipment itself overall? And just but like, it sounds like the equipment may be used uh, for classes during the week. Is that right, Lori? Yeah, that's correct. Like I said, like kindergarten is Monday and first grade is Tuesday. And then right. we're, we're all rotating between the different spaces. I mean, the I soccer was, field, the front lawn. I was thinking, you know, tape it off. Even still just have the tape there and then just, you know, on the designated days during school day, the designated class can use it even though it's taped off. Right. Maybe that will kind of just, because I know... Obviously, during the summer, we had the whole thing taped off. Right. And that was including the field, um, you know, by there in the, the pre-K little area, too. Yeah. I'm just thinking, what if you in, instead of covering that whole, like we did in the, you know, summertime, just cover, you know, tape off the actual, where the, um, the actual playground itself ends and wraps around to right. the street or to uh, Church Street. And you know, uh, that might work. It off, but then have the kids use it during school because it's their designated day. Right. They're... Right. Um, you know, I think that does help. There are signs up there. Um, I mean, the yellow tape was up until until early yesterday morning. So. I'm just I wondering. It didn't help. Ray, I'm just wondering if that, and Kim, I'm just wondering if that may be help because then the parents will see that the tape is there around the actual equipment itself. Right. Like I, if, I'm going to suggest okay. that that you talk to Tim about that. Uh, I My feeling is that we're going to, uh, you know, Kim and I said okay to his closing the playground and I'm going to leave it to him to figure out the details. I agree. And if that's okay with everybody else. And you, I mean, it may be a reasonable suggestion what you're making, what you're saying. Uh, I don't know exactly how it would be accomplished to be uh, uh, deter people when they're not supposed to be there and to allow a class to use it when they are supposed to be there. But I'm sure it can be worked out. But I, I won't leave it in his hands because he's He's sort of in charge of the facility during operating hours. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. I agree. Anybody else to say anything about this? Okay. Um, so I sent I sent all of you my report, except I, I forgot to send it to Jim. I'm sorry about that. Uh, really? But it's, it's mostly. Um, no, I don't have it in front of me, but you you know the uh, I should have made a copy for me to look at a physical copy. Um, I'm going to look for it at the moment. Can you hear me still? No. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. You can hear me. All right. I'm I'm just looking for. Uh, oh, shoot. Well, heck.
He sent it yesterday at 2.33. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm looking for the physical, the copy I have on the computer here. There we go. I thought I... Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm going to stay remote here. Um, so there's there's a recap of the building and grounds building and grounds projects of the summer, uh, which I don't really need to run through in detail. There's the painting contract, the total of that, um, the cost of the cost insofar as it's known as the fifth grade repair of the ceiling and the the drainage channel which uh at the moment is totaling out to fifty six hundred dollars and there is um uh, the reinstallation of the light banks and uh the drop ceiling panel costs the replacement panels and the labor that the village school put into reinstalling them and the Atlantic sprinkler replacing a couple of uh, sprinkler covers that uh, the caps were uh, iffy. One of them fell off. So two of them got replaced. So I don't know what that's going to run. I'm figuring that it's a total of about 6,000 to 6,500 maybe. And we've paid that now at this point, with these warrants, we will have paid that $5,661. Um, then there's the removal of the two Norway maples that would flank the walkway to the foyer from School Street. That was $2,100. Uh, and then remediation of lead in the drinking water system and a couple of spots on the third floor which we paid the costs of the fixtures and the filters that were installed. I don't know what Aiden charged for the installation, but I'm letting the village school pay that since they have, they will be submitting for reimbursement. Um, I, you know, I would say that's, you know, three, four hundred, five hundred dollars at most. And then, um, the last item is something that hasn't happened yet. Um, Roy Terry pointed out that the rubber around the ventilation, um, vent, vent, vent shaft that comes through the middle of the roof at the just past, just below the joint with the uh, gable roof on the main, uh, main uh, hallway of the school. Um, it's in the library roof and that rubber has been because of various reasons the rubber is degraded and uh, needs to be replaced and the guy from pinnacle came and looked at it and said that what needs to be done is we and probably should have been done from the beginning when it was put in was to create a cricket up above it on the gable roof so that water is diverted away from the uh, downside of that uh, exhaust uh, channel and over to the drains on either side. I don't know what that's going to cost, but Pinnacle said that it will entail them bringing a, a uh, crane <laughs> to get materials up there. So that, it's not going to be cheap. I just don't know what it's going to be. There's supposed to be an estimate coming. Um, and that will be our expense completely. And then the second uh, item in this is uh, the number of students choosing um, other ind independents other than VSNB and the Southwest Vermont Union Elementary Schools or FY21. And uh, at the moment, uh, the SVUESD schools have, there's Shaftesbury has 11 students uh, who are from our district. Molly Stark has two, Ben L has one. And um, 
two of the students at Shaftesbury are special ed. One is at Ben L. And um, we have certain costs for those that Matt and I had a meeting with Renee Gordon and with uh, Kate Abbott this morning but via Zoom to discuss those costs. And I will admit, go back to that in a minute. Um, then I have a recap of the budget for those choices versus what we, the, the actual cost for those choices versus the budget that we had established. And we end up um, mostly because of the additions to the SDUESD schools of about 42,000, a little over 42,000 over budget <clears throat> at the moment. We don't know how that's going to work out. Um, I pointed out that I made some notes on that, which I'm, let's see. I think um, I'm not going to make a point about the South Shire uh, rate that was incorrectly used uh, for the our budget because in fact we ended up with two fewer students there so we actually still come in under the budget. Um, the now we'll get to the special ed. We talked with Kate and Renee today. It appears that the uh, my understanding and Matt's here so he can back, backstop me on that, was that the problem is more or less that um, a couple of these students did not get put into our budget. <laughs> that, that is the part of the special ed bill that is actually in our budget because it's paid locally. And um, I think that was primarily what this discussion that we had was about. Um, and I made the point that um, from my perspective, I, you know, that those costs would have appeared in our budget had it been properly set up, set up you know, if, if they had been actually in that budget. So I don't have a problem with that portion of the cost um, coming back, coming to us, although it will be a bit of a lift for this district. But I wanted to be sure that we wouldn't pay, we wouldn't pay the uh, portion that was, should have been, should have been covered under the state's contribution of, of roughly 55% of the cost. So uh, as it turns out, uh, our share of that, as I reckon it, and I could be wrong about this uh, because I'm basing it on what I know and uh, not on the new, the new evolving situation, special ed is about 19, a little over $19,000. Um, all right, so, and then finally, um, a couple of unrelated, unrelated to the summer work and to the actual um, recounting of students uh, attending other institutions than BSNB is I, I talked with Tim about this and I believe it would be a a great thing if we could uh, initiate a conversation to to have DSNB participate in the food service committee and the CEP program that uh, would be a cost savings and um, I think I think it's appropriate given that uh, we they serve a hundred and 15 or so students from this district. Uh, and it's allowed under the rules of the, the program. And uh, we've already had the playground discussion. So that's basically the end of my report. Um, 
and I would, uh, I'm going to come back here, I think. I'm in the view again. All right, so I uh, welcome any questions or comments. I would just like to say that um, I appreciated meeting with uh, uh, Kate Abbott, Renee Gordon today. I think they were um, helpful in explaining the situation that we face um, regarding those expenses. I debriefed with them afterwards, Matt. I, I unfortunately was double booked at 10 o'clock, so could not attend at 10 o'clock, but I knew that you were in competent hands. Yeah. Indeed, um, very much, very much so. Um, I think the other part of that meeting was looking forward. I think looking back, we determined that mistakes were made um, on the calculations um, as we need to rely on the SU's, you know, complicated calculations. Uh, with student numbers, child find, all, all the different things. And at any rate, we ended up with the situation. But uh, looking forward, I think we've got a solution um, where we will, in the November budget, we will be determining, um, projecting those expenses based on the number of kids that, that need um, that further service. And you probably didn't hear anything I said from what I can see here. I heard you. I heard you. Oh, yep. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, basically that is up to the SU who, who does these, uh, the search and puts together that budget. But I think uh, on my side of it, I'm going to ask for uh, some more detail about how, the, how it was arrived at and how it relates to uh, what the understanding is of students that are coming into the special ed programming uh, in K-6, at any rate, uh, so that we don't have this happen again, because basically this is going to add about 20,000 to our expenditures for the year. Um, and uh, at the moment, we're as I, as I pointed out, we're over budget on the, the uh, non BSNB uh, component of our student population. Uh, in a way, it's a it's it's a good thing, but only about two years down the road, if, <laughs> when these students' uh, numbers get fully into our equalized pupil count. And I, right. I don't know what the uh, DSNB numbers are, so I won't know for a bit, I'm sure. Ray, I would just like to, uh, you know, make the point that, yes, we are encumbered with a $20,000, hopefully it's limited to that expense um, that was unforeseen, but, but we would be re responsible for that expense regardless. It, yes. it wasn't like... It just wasn't budgeted, yeah. and and I guess I will say that was to no fault of our own. But um, it's not like it's not like we're getting hit with something that we wouldn't have been responsible for, regardless of of where right. uh, the children attended or any of that. So yeah, it, it did impact your budget planning, but from what I'm told, that Renee has offered a solution on how we can. Uh, Yep. prevent that from being an upfront budget impact for you right now, correct? Uh, and we appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly if we're, what what that language means, but that's not what I heard exactly. But uh, I think I think we we're we not going to have we bill you for the for the SU because right. we'll yep. wait for the reimbursement. Yeah. Right. That's right. Let's see. That that if that's what you meant, yes, we that's, right. that's, what, that's right. It, yeah. It's not like you you're going to need to come up with an additional twenty thousand right now, right? So. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. 
and that dovetails to the way I described it uh, about in terms of getting the same, basically the same bill as if we were a Shaftesbury or uh, or S B U E S D. And I also heard a commitment from Kate Abbott to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Yeah, and I, I, uh, I believe that commitment. So, you know, she's she's uh, pretty knowledgeable and energetic, and she's swamped, but she'll she'll make it happen. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't. I don't have anything else to say that I can think of at the moment. Uh, um, so, Lori? The only thing I want to say is that I've been getting some um, bits and pieces of information, different language on how budget votes might be working in March. Um, and I don't know, Jim, have you heard anything? Ray, have you heard anything? No. I have not. So, Okay, so um, I have, and it appears to be fairly similar to what's happening with the general elections um, in November and what's happened um, in August. And um, I have a meeting about this in a couple of weeks, and it sounds like they're going to try to send a lot of absentees out, uh, trying to go the same route that they did with the other, well, with the upcoming November elections and with mm -hmm. the August primaries. So, oh, so you're, what you're referring to, they, they're going to allow mail-in voting for budget votes. Um, yeah, and I think they're trying to set that up the way that they did previously. And this isn't from the town of Bennington or anything. This is general information yep. from the state of Vermont. And I'll certainly keep good track of the information that I get and let you know. I do think that it'll be... Um, interesting to say the okay. least. but i was just curious to see if you had received any information as well on that not, not i know it's early but it is coming up no i think i think they've contacted the right person and you and who the clerk for i assume the clerk for the uh sd uesd would, would have been con that would be cassie actually right or am i wrong about that she's the clerk yeah yeah right so she already knows that, I'm sure. So yeah. she's been contacted. I'm sure. My, okay. my only, I think what, what um, Lori is trying to say is that unlike uh, the general election coming up where the state will be, in fact, I just heard they're going to send ballots, not only those requested, you know, the last mailing we all get uh, You're breaking up there, man. You're going to actually send them to everybody. And it's going to be, you know, they're doing that. And that's that's the advantage that Lori will not have right. when, um, when she has to send out ballots to, right. I presume, just those that are requested, but it will be a higher number. So... Right, and they're just they're just putting limitations on voting situations as far as um, you know people in person and just just all of it. So I'm sure it'll become more apparent as to what's expected um, of me in the next couple of months. But interesting to be getting information already. Right. So that will uh, in increase expenses of the, the secretary that's you for running that election and uh it's sort of a, a warning to us <laughs> we're well, going to spend go. more money <laughs> what's well, new you know it's always and, more money and perhaps for a very different landscape uh emerge yeah um who knows yep all right well um I have nothing else to talk about. So um, uh, we do have an other, and, but we've covered most of the what I was going to talk about in other, uh, except for one item, which is um, that we basically have, I mean, we have two projects that we need to finish up 
on the building. One, of course, is doing the roof, which we patched it while with Roy Terry while he was working there because he could do that. But uh, we need to conduct a, a bidding for that roof replacement uh, in order to get that set up for uh, being accomplished next summer, I assume next summer. Um, and um, so I'm going to be look, I believe the person I look to is Renee, uh, who is, is in charge of uh, running this for the supervisor union. Is that correct, Jim? Yes. Okay. Well, she and, works with the clerks. Yeah. Yep. And the other item is uh, we've done basically two faces of the building in terms of dealing with the essential maintenance practices on the paint work up there. And we need to do the uh, west side and the north side and a portion of the south side to finish that up and be in compliance with um, having no chipping peeling paint up there. Since we presume that it's, there is lead underneath and we accept that. <laughs> so uh, I did not need to conduct a, a bidding this, this year because it ended up, well, actually I could have conducted a building, but I, I got a, I got enough responses, some of which were just, we can't do it, we don't have time. Uh, but I got, I think, five, five different responses and two of them produced prices and we selected from that, those two. But uh, we, we could go ahead and do it that way again or we could um, actually put that out to bid as well. Um, I think we should determine that. I think the roof is a much bigger project, so I definitely think we're forced to go to a formal bidding process there. But on the painting, I think we could do what we did this past year, which is solicit uh, local people that we're aware of and see if they'll provide us a, a bid, a price. And that's uh, that's my FY. My uh, other for this meeting, and I would entertain a motion to close the meeting. So I'm moved. All right. Everybody in agreement with that? Yes, I'll second that. All right. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Aye. We are, we are done. Thank you, Jim, for being Bye. here.